uh, listening to the conversations, not just from what's going on up here, but the questions posed by the audiences. And there's, there's a, a great feeling, which I think is highly representative, which talks about, you know, technology, this, this sort of... Um, not obsession, but this understanding about the penetration of technology, does it make us more resilient, less resilient? Does it um, give us greater understanding, the ability to reach out to people? Uh, it, it's, it's interesting, but this is particular to this audience. And I was, um, uh, I'm a great reader of the FT, and, and so you end up looking through the world through a financial prism a lot of the time. And so Nazim Taleb uh, gave this great speech in George Washington University a week ago, where he said, the world is more fragile now than at any time that it's been since 2007. And his analysis was based purely on the fact that there was now $247 trillion worth of debt. And while this debt had moved from property across to governments and corporations and indeed to individuals, this was, he said, the greatest fragility that represented the state. Now, at Rusi, we might dispute that and think it's different. Um, interestingly, uh, Nazim Taleb, this is the guy who wrote Black Swan and uh, Anti-Fragile and all those other uh, good stuff that he comes out with, didn't ever say that the world is more dangerous than it has ever been before. Nor does he say it's more fragile than it's been ever before. Perhaps some of those historians here, I know um, Jill is back there, you know, would tell us that the world has been in this state previously. You know, if one looked back in um, 1913, if one looks to 1938, one looks further back to 1814, to 1805, there are periods in which nation states have been similarly vulnerable, having similar conversations. And actually, when we go back to look in some ways, as people have been reminiscing about the halcyon days post 9-11 or, uh, uh, or in the Cold War, the idea of filling a bath or painting your windows white, these were an anomaly, not the norm in history. We shouldn't somehow be surprised that society is unprepared. The question is how prepared we want them to be. And so when we came across this subject, this idea that you and I started talking about two years ago, that Elizabeth Brewer is now uh, running at Rusia of modern deterrence, it wasn't simply about the idea that deterrence against an adversary was nuclear or conventional or similarly about societal resilience. Indeed, uh, Dr. Jenny Cole ran a great program at RUSI which looked at resilience through the spectrum of NATO. It, it was fascinating. But it was also about deterrence by denial, about making you a less attractive target than your neighbor. Uh, and this happened for states as well. Uh, and it's some of these subjects and some of these things that came up today that um, uh, our final speaker is hopefully uh, going, to, uh, going to be tested on. And, and therefore, it is a huge pleasure to welcome uh, someone who has dealt not only with government, uh, but at the top levels in NATO, uh, and then in the private sector for BP and, um, uh, and others, and the world of think tankery, Ditch Park, uh, uh, Chatham House and others, uh, and always a, a great pleasure to have here. Um, Lord Robertson has a CV that is quite rightly the longest on the bios that you've got. He's got you know, huge experience from, you know, from the bottom level right to the top at decision-making, policy-making, and implementation. You know, this idea, not simply that it's someone who sat the government in an ivory tower, but someone who engaged with this subject and others over a long and illustrious career, and therefore it's a great pleasure to have you um, with us. Lord Robertson, I, I guess the first thing that I'd like to ask, and I've got to say, this is, this is unrehearsed, so Lord Robertson might be getting some nasty shocks and might look slightly perplexed at me when I ask these questions, but if part of this deterrence by denial, this modern deterrence is about making a neighbour more attractive to attack than you. Is that something that is distinctly distasteful for governments to have to think about? I mean, if we're saying that we in the UK want to be more resilient than France, so someone attacks France instead of us, is that something that, that you know, that, that is an uncomfortable thing to be said, but surely that's at the heart of deterrence by denial, right? Well it, well, it is, but I, you would never articulate anything like that. Uh, <clears throat> and anyway, I, I, I'm uh, publishing on Thursday a document on British-French defence post-Brexit, uh, uh, a working party I've been chairing with Bernard Cazeneuve, the last Prime Minister of, uh, of France. And you'll see in that a number of the themes that have been discussed uh, today, which is, you know, building a new cyber pillar to the Lancaster House agreements that we, we need to do a, a more formalized uh, view of intelligence sharing, um, that we've got to protect 
um, defence and security from from Brexit. So you know this is completely the wrong way to start off a discussion on deterrence and trying to deter what the French are going to do to us. Seems to me to be popular, but not the right way of doing it. And I, I recommend the report that we've uh, that, that this uh, that this working party has uh, has produced uh, for that. Um, but I think we you know. In, in many ways, the discussion of today is under the wrong banner. You know, we, we flushed out a number of really serious questions here uh, that have got societal implications uh, that government needs to think about, society generally needs to think about, government both, both national and local uh, as, uh, as well. Um, but the audience, you know, having looked through the audience list, is largely people involved in defence and security, whereas in fact it should be a much broader scope. And indeed it must involve industry. You know, Martha Lane Fox started us off this morning with these horrifying statistics about 70% of companies having no cyber plan, you know, and even that last, uh, our last discussion there, Richard Keeley, with, with that wonderful statement he said that... Uh, most companies' cyber attack plans were in the computers, um, underlines, uh, underlines what it is. So, you know, deterrence is not just nuclear deterrence, which is back in the headlines again with the challenge to the INF Treaty, but which has been with us for a very, very long time and has worked, has worked, is working every day, all day, so that when we talk about existential threats to us now, we don't think in terms of a state attack. Uh, on 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 our borders, uh, we have an alliance here in NATO that has been durable and has also worked. The red lines of Article Five are very bright and very red, and they're they're into the psychology of any adversary at the same time, which is why adversaries look at areas to the periphery. But what we need to do is to is is to, is to look at what Martha Lane Fox was to talk about, you know. Uh, situations on the boundaries of war and that is that is where the the thought processes need now to be uh, to be focused you know I, I i picked out my, my laurie friedman's definition of deterrence we said deterrence is concerned with deliberate attempts to manipulate the behavior of others through conditional threats which is an interesting definition but actually does suit the cyber world in exactly the same way as it was originally devised in terms of nuclear deterrence. But it, 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 so if we, it, you know, the, the talk has, to me, felt very much about ourselves. It, and it's more about a resilience conversation than a deterrence conversation. And actually, if we're talking about deterrence by denial, deterrence by punishment, should we not be focusing on the adversary then? You know, if we take Laurie Friedman's, you know, definition, it's about um, uh, making a behavioural change or forcing a, coercing a behavioural change in someone else, in this case fairly clearly Russia, from our point of view, from NATO's point of view, um, trying to make it, you know, conform to normative behaviours, uh, as we would understand. And, and yet much of the discussion we've had is about changing society to be resilient to those attacks rather than changing the behaviours of others. Do... How do we communicate this correctly to Russia? Because if we say that we've been hugely successful, then surely this idea where Russia constantly butts up against the threshold of war, never crossing the red lines, but always at that threshold, as, as Graham Land described it, pushing us, pushing those boundaries of normative behaviour. Do we need to refocus the deterrence discussion, whether it's you know, the resilience of societal population or, uh, or nuclear and conventional force deployments or international trade or treaty arrangements? Do these need to change? Do we need to focus this conversation on Russia rather than simply thinking about it in terms of, in terms of other ways? Why, why focus on Russia? You know, Russia, China, North Korea, um, Iran, these were all mentioned today. You know, Russia is spending $43 billion a year on defence. We spend $52 billion on defence. NATO in Europe spends three hundred, over $300 billion on defence. NATO as a whole with the Americans spends $1.2 trillion on defence. China, however, is spending $179 billion on defence and rising. Actually, you know, Russia... Russia reduced its defence budget uh, last time. So we, we need to look to the spectrum of threats. Article 5 has been invoked once. 
I did it, I read it out at the time, and it was only when I read it out I sort of fully recognised the significance of what I was, I was actually reading. But that was in relation to an attack by Al-Qaeda on the United States of America. It wasn't the Russian attack or on, on any of us as well. But I think we need to focus on, on what the adversary is thinking because, as, as Laurie Friedman said, it is getting into the minds of the adversary that there is an incalculable cost to them if they're to do something. But what our adversaries are doing, and, and it's the spectrum of it, is to looking at our weak points. We are enormously strong. As I say, the, the, the figures of defense expenditure are illustrated only, only too well. But they focus on our weaknesses, on our, on our electoral systems, on our democratic institutions. They, you know, they, they focus on disruption rather than attack. Um, and the, these are the areas where we need to be much more robust, where we need to safeguard our institutions. You know, the great strength that we have is that we are democracies. Everything is done by consent. You know, we, we, are, we, we are nations that believe in democratic values and spell them out. You know, I sort of tried last night just to... But what do we mean by democratic values? You know, we talk about it glibly, but we, we know... We know in, instinctively what we're talking about. But we're talking about free speech, a free press. We're talking about internet freedom, freedom for religion, a mixed economy, the separation of church and state, the rule of law, an independent judiciary, private property, international cooperation, and tolerance, tolerance in our societies. You know, that is the, the great strength that we, we actually have and that many people don't have. You know, uh, Russia doesn't have many allies. China has got hardly any allies. Iran has got precious few allies other than those coerced. And North Korea has got zero in the way of allies. But the West is made up of allies with a common purpose and a common, a, a, a common determination. And the, you know, uh, in the Eisenhower era, you know, Corey Shackey identified in, in an article in The Atlantic just uh, last week how Eisenhower, after the war, put together a national strategy by bringing in all the experts to look at all of the different ways in which the American national strategy could be and knitted it all together. And one of it, he said, was to do, this is NAC 1622, it was called apparently at the time, not the Strategic Defense Review, as mine was called, but the maintenance of morale and free institutions was one of the key ingredients of, of a strong resilient society and he said public support was quotes ultimately dependent also on the soundness of the national morale and the political willingness of the country to support a government which it feels is holding the proper balance between the necessary sacrifices and the necessary defense so we we've got that and in a way we take it for granted we don't you know proclaim it we don't protect it in the way that we should. And therefore, if we're going to deter in the future, it's not just going to be by nuclear weapons and, and the threat of, of mutual assured destruction. It's not going to be by military means, uh, all the 10,000 main battle tanks that are available in the, in the NATO armed forces. It's going to be by robustly protecting our own democratic institutions and making sure that other people outside can't, can't inveigle their way into it. Great. Right. So there is a limited opportunity uh, for questions from the floor as well. So if you have one, uh, uh, please thread in while we have a, a, a few minutes remaining.